Survival Horror. The chances are, if you're of an older age, you think of pre-rendered backgrounds, tank controls, limited resources, over-the-top puzzles, and more importantly, being scared. If you're a young girl, when you hear Survival Horror, you think of... When you start to play Resident Evil 6 You hammer the buttons and wiggle the sticks To punch or to shoot or to jump or to kick You hammer the buttons and wiggle the sticks Back in 1992, when I was at college, I came across a game on the PC that was like nothing I'd seen before. It was like an interactive horror film. And I loved horror films. That game was Alone in the Dark. Alone in the Dark was developed and published by Infograms, yes, Grams, back in 1992, and is widely recognised as the first 3D survival horror game. It even made it into the Guinness Book of Records Games Edition back in 2008 with this achievement. The game was the brainchild of Frederick Renal, a programmer at Infograms. Back in 1989, he was working on a port, an early 3D game called Alpha Waves. During this time, Frederick developed some tools for the creation and animation of 3D characters. It was these that would later go on to be used to create the graphics in Alone in the Dark. In 1991, Bruno Bonnell, the CEO for Infograms, proposed a game in which players use matches to light their way in an otherwise completely darkened environment. I guess he played Haunted House in the Atari 2600, a game which was released way back in 1982. Interestingly, Infograms would later go on to buy Atari and use that label to release products, even making two remakes of the Haunted House game, getting back to Alone in the Dark. When Renal heard this proposal, he saw it as an opportunity to create a horror-based video game, which was something that interested him. During the development, the game went by numerous titles, all featuring dark in them. In the dark, scream in the dark, Screams in the dark, dark in the dark, that last one may be a lie. The game's setting was decided to be a mansion in the 1920s. This would allow the developers to have a large enough area for gameplay and the year allowed them to handle or completely do away with, modern inconveniences and electricity easily and create the atmosphere that they were after. It was planned that the game would use scanned photographs of an actual mansion, but this was ultimately too much of a challenge for the 3D technology of the time, so hand-drawn artwork was used instead. I still love the look of these graphics today. There was something about 2D bitmaps from graphics around this time, very stylized but still striving for realism. Items and characters were 3D polygonal objects and rendered over the top of static 2D backgrounds, something that would be a staple of the genre for years to come. As the character moved around, the camera angle would change, giving the game a very cinematic experience. The game designers could very carefully plan camera position and placement to get the best out of the tension and atmosphere in the room, much like directors and cinematographers do in movies. For a brief time, the game had the Call of Cthulhu license from Chaos, and, but it was decided that Alone in the Dark didn't really reflect pen and paper RPG mechanics enough. Nevertheless, it still kept many of its Lovecraftian trappings and creatures, such as the faces of Night Gaunts and Deep Ones, which I love. The game features a large amount of text to relay the story, but if you had the CD-ROM version, most of it is read to you by some of the best and most over-the-top voice acting in a the game. They are coming! 
I have freed hellish forces, and now the price must be paid. Der Seto is the prey of evil. The sun has set. They will find my body, but will not have my soul. I can imagine the master's fury and the terror in the hearts of his slaves. <gasps> I hear their footsteps. Some may understand what I have done. May God forgive me. Farewell, Jeremy Hartwood. Oh, yes. This was the first game I could remember, apart from an RPG, where you got to pick the character of either male or female. I'm not saying it was the first, but it's the first I can remember. You could play as either Private Detective Edward Carnby, or as Emily Hartwood, a relative of the mansion's recently deceased owner. The plot of the game revolves around Jeremy Hartwood, an artist and owner of the DeSetto mansion, who has committed suicide by hanging himself in the house. You enter the house and make your way to the attic to search for a secret drawer in the piano stored there, hoping to find the suicide note of Jeremy. As soon as you enter the house, the door slams shut behind you. Now you must solve the mystery of the house. This is not an easy game as there are many instant deaths involving traps and monsters, but none of them feel cheap. My advice, save often. Once you've explored the initial part of the attic, you are free to explore the rest of the house in pretty much any order you want. Interaction with the game world is handled with an interface very reminiscent of a point and click or even a text adventure. There are commands that can be selected such as open, search, push, pick up and fight. Items in your inventory can be used, read, dropped, and even thrown. Speaking of which, your inventory space is limited and dependent on the size and weight of the object you are currently carrying. There isn't any sort of visual guide to how full your inventory is, so once you are done with an object, you are best throwing it away. The controls may put many gamers off, even those that have played later tank control survival horror games. Movement is done not with the WASD keys, but with the arrow keys. To run, you must double tap the up arrow. Most of the time, you won't pull this off, and you end up stuttering around the room. There is even some platforming that can be infuriating when it's used to fix style camera angles, especially when there are long shots. Another later staple of the survival hunger genre is the very limited ammo that is given to you. You have to make sure that every round counts. There is melee combat that is implemented, but it's done in a very unusual way. You have to put yourself into a fight stance and hold down the up or down arrow to do a different swing. It's not recommended that you can get yourself in a stun lock and quickly end up dead, even against the smallest of creatures. The game doesn't ease you in, it starts hard and carries on in that vein, which is another thing that puts many modern players off who are used to their tutorial sections and ever increasing difficulty in levels. That being said, there are ways to avoid a lot of the dangers in the game. For instance, in the beginning of the game in the attic, push the wardrobe over the window. This will stop one monster from bursting through. Next, push the chest over the trapdoor to stop the zombie from entering the room. Now the attic is safe. In the hallway downstairs, you will notice that the floorboard creaked in the opening cinematic. Never walk over this part of the floor as it will collapse, leading to an instant death. From this hallway, take the door to the left. In this room, do not step on the rug as it will trigger a monster. Go back to the hallway and take the door on the right. Close it straight away to avoid the zombie that tries to enter. In the next room is a fight that cannot be avoided, but by following the above you should still be at full health. There are many instances of things like this in the game, where you have a choice of your gameplay style, which is something that is not really done in modern games nowadays. One thing that always stuck in my head, even after years of not playing it, was the music. I love the music. The CD-ROM version updated the score, and whilst it isn't bad, it is not as good as the original. The music will really keep you on your toes, as sometimes it will pick up tempo when there is nothing there, keeping you guessing as to when something bad is about to happen to you. As already mentioned, the game is heavily inspired by the works of H.P. Lovecraft. It can even find copies of the Necronomicon and De Vermis Mysterious within the game. There's also a reference to the history of Lord Bolskin, which is a direct reference to another infogrammed Lovecraftian game called The Shadow of the Comet. Just be careful which books you read and where you read them, as some can lead to insanity and death. 
Several of the game's creatures are lifted directly from the Cthulhu Mythos as well, such as the aforementioned Night Gods and Deep Ones, as well as the Cophonium from Brian Lumley's Cement Surroundings and the Burrows Beneath stories. These creatures are found in the caverns below the mansion, as well as outside if you try and leave the mansion by the front door before your task is complete. The character of Edward Carnby is probably a reference to John Carnby, a character who appears in Clark Ashton Smith's Return of the Sorcerer and Mythos story. When the game was released, it was met with high critical praise and acclaim, and infograms wanted to capitalise this and get a sequel made as quick as they could. Unfortunately, due to the events that had happened during the development, Frederick was feeling a bit burnt out. He even went on record as saying that he felt dissatisfied with almost every aspect of Alone in the Dark, and felt certain that all its flaws would be noticed by players. As such, he didn't have anything to do with any of the sequels, which moved away from the Lovecraftian story that this game has. The first sequel was released in 1993 and involved Carnby investigating gangsters and pirates which were possessed by evil spirits. Alone in the Dark 3 was released in 1994 which involved a Wild West ghost town. Each game moved away from the adventure horror gameplay into a more action orientated game, yet still used the original game's engine which really wasn't suited for this style of gameplay. A reboot of the series was attempted in 2001 with Alone in the Dark A New Nightmare. This was set in modern times and introduced the concept that Edward Carnby belonged to a lineage of shadow hunters who were all born on the 29th of February every 40 years, and so Edward here was a descendant of Carnby from the original games. Um, yeah, okay. And then there's something to do with the name being an anglicised version of the Native American El Wakwambi, which means the one who battles evil incarnate and hunts out the shadows. Uh... Despite all this, the game was actually enjoyable to play and featured some really detailed backgrounds and some great lighting effects for its time. Then, in 2008, there was another reboot that was just called Alone in the Dark, or if you had the PS3 version, Alone in the Dark Inferno. This pretty much ignored the new nightmare and once again was set in modern times, but this time featured the same Edward Carnby from the original games who is now immortal and forgotten his past or something. The game wasn't very good and had terrible controls. It was buggy as hell and felt like a tech demo for the fire effects that had been created. It must have known how bad it was because they even added a skip section feature which resembled a DVD player. Although you got an achievement for each stage completed if you didn't use this. Which I didn't and I got the achievements. But why? Even though I really wanted to at times, especially during the awful, awful driving sections. There was also a lot of busy work. You know, go here, do this. Good. Now go here and do it 20 more times. Recently, Atari have just released Alone in the Dark Illumination on Steam. A multiplayer game which... Wait, hold up. What? A multiplayer game of something called Alone in the Dark Illumination. So, you're not alone then. Also, illumination? So, you're not in the dark either? So really, it's together in the light. <sighs> Why can't they just make another good Alone in the Dark game? This has made more frustrating when you discover that Frederick was going to do a remake of the original. Apart from the obnoxious quick time events, this looked like it could have been pretty good. Instead, we get Together in the Light. Oh, and then there was also two Alone in the Dark movies made, but <laughs> the less said about them, the better. Still, I always have the original and greatest game to play. If you fancy giving it a try, go to good old games where you can buy it for next to nothing. And not only that, they throw in parts 2 and 3, and the mini game Jack in the Dark, which was released to promote part 2. This is a classic game which fans of survival horror, adventure games, or HP Lovecraft should experience. It's not an easy journey, but it is rewarding. So turn off your lights, fire up the game, and become alone in the dark. <laughs>